missed and misdiagnosis using conventional 2D radiographs. And this will cover a comparison of two-dimensional radiographs versus three-dimensional CBCT, or cone beam computed tomography. My name is Dan McGowan. I'm a general dentist uh, in Hagerstown, Maryland. I'm a university uh, graduate from Loma Linda University School of Dentistry, 1982, and uh, have been uh, practicing for nearly 30 years. Um, the CBCT is one of those wow moments in my career. I actually saw CBCT for the first time approximately 10 years ago at the uh, a Amos meeting, the oral surgery meeting down in Orlando, Florida. And I walked by the booth, uh, saw the images, and these were early images, 8-bit technology, so fairly fuzzy by today's standards. And my uh, exact comment to the uh, people behind the booth were, you know, was what is it, uh, how come I've never seen this before, and when can I get one. And I'm hoping after you see just this one case today, you'll kind of have a wow moment as well in terms of what could I do with this, how will it change my practice, and how will it uh, help um, with my diagnosis and treatment planning with my own patients. Uh, as I was saying earlier, I've been in private practice for 29 years. I've been using CBCT for over seven years. Um, had uh, actually one of the first CBCT machines uh, on the East Coast. Uh, thought everybody would jump on the bandwagon uh, in terms of using it, but most people didn't understand the technology and you know, were kind of stuck in the 2D paradigm. Um, I have uh, lectured and trained for various laser systems over the years, BioLace, Lairs, Yoshida, Picasso, Fox. I love lasers. Uh, I love new technology, including uh, CBCT. Um, I lecture uh, on cone beam for ICOI and AID uh, as well, and uh, have authored uh, numerous articles uh, on CBCT as well as laser dentistry. Uh, the case we're going to talk about today is a 40-year-old female, came in uh, tooth number 28, lower right bicuspid, and uh, had a varied history from being a normal tooth to having pain. So we're going to follow this through the endo treatment, the endo failure, and uh, eventual extraction implant placement. And what we want to do here, the whole point of this little uh, uh, program is to show you the difference between 2D and 3D radiographs and you be the judge in terms of how you would diagnose, how you would treatment plan um, and uh, you know we'll just let the pictures do the talking for us. So we'll begin with a 2D x-ray, uh, really no visible pathology on tooth number 28. You can see number 29, 30 as well as 27 all have endo. So the patient does have a history of uh, uh, endo issues, uh, chronic pain in these teeth. And this uh, radiograph you see here, it's a digital uh, radiograph, a Kodak digital sensor. Um, doesn't really show any pathology. Uh, the tooth is just very sensitive uh, to pressure, temperature, and general soreness. And uh, as you can see from the history of endo, this patient uh, you know, wants to move right into endo. And with uh, percussion and heat, the patient does react. So an endodontic procedure was initiated there. If we uh, go back historically, this patient had had implants uh, a couple years prior. Um, and I want you to take a look at these images. Uh, this was done post uh, extraction, actually. We found this uh, CBCT scan, and we did review w what we saw there on the CBCT prior to this tooth being uh, symptomatic. And you can see about midway down the root, uh, the top left image, there's a little yellow arrow. The top right image, it's just a colorized version that, that seems to show up a little better. We do see a, a fairly robust lateral canal there. And then we have axial slices below in black and white and color uh, that do show this uh, lateral canal uh, coming out midway down the root. And you'll see in the pictures that are coming up that this lateral canal is uh, going to be the problem area. 
Uh, I also want you to notice in the upper right it says these images are reversed. On the CBCT scan, where the way my machine is set up, you're actually looking at these teeth uh, in the sagittal section from the lingual view. So it's going to look opposite, obviously, when you take a periapical uh, from the, the buccal surface there. So here we have uh, fast forward to 2011 and you can see that little bit of radiolucency out the side and you can see in the endophil there there's really no sealer coming out the side there uh, but the only thing that's suspicious is that little bit of widening right there uh, to the distal of that uh, what we have identified as that uh, lateral canal there. Uh, once again, the patient um, has generalized pain in the area, and the pain is at a level that she just wants the tooth out. And she has a history of having uh, these teeth taken out and implants placed. And um, she was uh, pretty much at her wit's end with this right here. But if you look at this x-ray carefully, uh, you will notice that there's really not a huge radiolucency there. Um, it's a little bit different than the one we looked at prior to that and you can scroll back through the presentation and look at the 2009 x-ray and see that there is a little bit of a change there but certainly nothing that would send up a red flag saying wow this tooth has you know a, a major problem here so we move on to the CBCT scan that was taken the same day as that previous x-ray there and uh, if we start in the upper left figure one there you will see a very large lateral radiolucency that did not show up on the uh, 2D x-ray that I just showed previous to this. And I've showed you figure one and figure two are just actually two different slice thicknesses. Um, they show the same pathology. But as you add thickness, um, the image actually uh, looks more like a normal x-ray, like the one on the top left there. And in figure three in the bottom left there is an axial slice. So we're actually slicing uh, through the tooth uh, top to bottom there. And once again, it shows the extent of this radiolucency and, uh, you know, shows why this patient perhaps was having a little more pain than we could diagnose from the 2D x-ray. Also, if you jump back up to figure one in the top left, you see a slight radiolucency uh, at the apex of number 30 as well. Now, one thing you want to remember is these are thin slices uh, through these teeth. So if you look at the endodontic fill in tooth number 30, uh, it's not showing up. But you remember we're just doing a 0.07 millimeter slice of that tooth. So we could either be buccal or lingual to the actual endodontic fill there. Um, but the CBCT did, in fact, show us a completely different picture of number 28 there. Um, the patient, uh, being frustrated with pain and all long term, did elect to have the tooth removed and an implant placed. She's had, you know, very good success with implants. So we use some uh, minimally invasive uh, dental tools, uh, luxators, which are thin stainless steel instruments to preserve the the socket of the tooth um, and to preserve buccal bone and so the tooth was conservatively uh, removed using luxators. A, uh, an osteotomy was done in the apical region. We really didn't modify the coronal portion of the socket too much, uh, but we did uh, modify the apical region there. Uh, we did, in fact, uh, curatage with some spoons uh, the lateral abscess. We were able to get it out in one piece, leaving bare bone there. And I'm a firm believer in uh, all wavelengths of, of dental lasers and their ability to ablate uh, not only soft tissue but hard tissue and also to disinfect areas uh, with laser energy without doing damage to uh, the bone and surrounding tissue. And so in this case, I use the uh, BioLace, the water lace which is a YSGG wavelength. It works very well with both soft tissue and hard tissue to do a disinfection of the socket. The uh, cortical bone in the socket, uh, we scratched up a bit with just some sharp instruments to get some bleeding going. And then we did place a bone level implant and the patient was placed on antibiotics for 10 days 
and monitored there. So that was all pretty uneventful in terms of placing that there. And here's a 2D x-ray again showing the implant placement and you can actually see the radiolucency um, in the lateral wall where this was placed. In a case like this where it's midway down the route, I did not place any sort of uh, grafting material, uh, initiating bleeding there, a clot will form and that will fill in with bone uh, quite easily in that position there. The one thing this uh, 2D x-ray doesn't show us is the position of the inferior alveolar nerve or the mental foramen. And these are issues with placing lower implants because these are areas we do want to avoid uh, you know, damaging nerves and giving patients uh, either temporary or permanent paresthesia. This is, uh, these three images we see on this slide, figure one, two, and three actually show the uh, implant in place. And the, and the beauty of cone beam is you can correct in the X, Y, and Z axis. So we can see from figure one in the upper left, uh, nice placement of our implant in terms of how it relates to the roots on either side. Um, we have a sagittal view. The, the, the first view, figure one, is actually a 3D view. Uh, figure two is actually a sagittal slice side to side showing implant placement uh, similar to what we see in figure one. And then figure three is an axial view front to back which shows the amount of bone buccolingual uh, to the implant placement. And um, so we can see we have adequate bone on the buccal surface uh, of that implant and we're getting nice integration uh, there as well. And this is something you're not going to see on a 2D x-ray as well. Other advantage of CBCT, and we look at this next slide here, you will see we have marked the nerve as well as the mental foramen there, and we also have the arrow pointing to the tooth that was going to come out. So in this case, we can evaluate, are we going to have any issues with uh, impinging on the nerve? Uh, anytime you're doing uh, lower uh, implants in the area of first or second bicuspids, you have to be very aware of where the inferior alveolar nerve is coming uh, along there, where is the mental foramen, and, and we do want to uh, recognize that there is an anterior branch to this mandibular nerve that's often overlooked. And uh, the ability to mark this nerve and to do accurate measurements certainly makes uh, your implant placement uh, more precise, uh, but it also takes out that fear factor that you may do damage, um, you know, to those nerve uh, areas there. Our next slide here is just uh, some thin slices, sagittal, as well as an axial slice uh, showing um, on the left slide the length uh, of bone between the tip of the original root and the anterior branch of the uh, inferior alveolar nerve. Also, it shows uh, right below that length the average bone density around this, this tooth here. And so you can evaluate, uh, you know, what size implant. Uh, you can compare your osteotomy to the size implant if you want to compress bone to get a tighter fit. And uh, there again, the uh, lateral abscess is shown there. And then if we look at the uh, picture to our right, uh, there again you can see we have um, a uh, inferior alveolar nerve mark, and you can also see we have real thin buccal plates. So this implant uh, was actually p placed more to the lingual and bone allowed to fill in on the uh, buccal aspect there. Um, CBCT uh, is a one-to-one -one, uh, measurement. Because the X, Y, and Z axis are all equal, uh, no matter what way you slice or dice these views, you're getting one-to-one -one, uh, accurate uh, measurements. But there again, this is all about uh, implant placement, uh, in this case, uh, and safety, staying away from areas that you don't want to uh, get in trouble with. So the case is now done. The patient is doing very well, pain-free. But the point of this short presentation is to show that, uh, you know, this is th literally just a, just a little piece of what we use CBCT for every month in our office. 
and below I've listed a, a, a fairly robust list of things that you can do with uh, CBCT that you really can't do adequately with 2D x-rays. And uh, you know, just starting with endodontic lesions, uh, you're always going to find with a CBCT that your endodontic lesion is much larger than what it appears on a 2D x-ray. So in terms of apicos, things like that, it's going to change, you know, do we do an apico? You know, what's the, what is the real cause of this failed endo? Things like that. Missed roots, third molar position related to nerves or bone uh, and sinuses, uh, nerve canal position for implants, bone volume and quality and, you know, type one, two, three, four bone. Impacted canines or other teeth, uh, sinus grafts, uh, what kind of uh, issues do we have with those? Uh, a really nice feature is the ability to follow an infected sinus uh, to the root tip that's causing it. It will help you eliminate, uh, you know, what is the real cause of your sinus issue slash toothache. Uh, supernumerary, mesiodin position, you know, how are we going to get those in the most conservative way? Uh, from an orthodontic standpoint, uh, you can check uh, the actual accurate size and volume of the teeth, uh, you know, to determine whether you're going to extract or keep the teeth and expand. Uh, for periodontal issues, it's a great thing to be able to pull the scan up and describe a pocket, not in just words, but show the patient the actual periodontal defect in 3D. Now the patient owns the problem. They understand what a pocket is. Uh, so it's a great tool for that as well. And so um, 3D multiplanar slices, not just for graft evaluation and implant placement, but for perio issues, uh, for um, all kinds of issues patients have with how am I going to get my bite back? What can we do? So it's a wonderful tool for many, many things in the office there. I firmly believe that uh, CBCT is like, like the best technology for today's dentist uh, in terms of changing the way we practice. It will give you the best diagnosis possible and ultimately if you have the proper diagnosis uh, you will end up with the proper treatment plan. The thing I found with CBCT is the patients get involved with their treatment plan and they look at that screen they say that's me this is unbelievable and because they now see in 3d what's there they begin to own the problem they become part of the solution they get excited about what you can do for them and I believe that we owe it to our patients and to ourselves to have the best information available. And if you incorporate CBCT into everyday practice, you can have that. So with that, I wish you well and, and uh, hope you have gotten a little taste of what 3D uh, CBCT images can do for your diagnosis and treatment planning.